Hi, good morning. My name is Mike Taylor. I work for Elsevier Labs, which is a small R&D unit in the technology part of Elsevier. Uh, the last two or three years, I've been working in the area of altmetrics. Um, but in the last sort of six months to nine months, I've been working with folk in our metrics group. Um, and I, I do a lot of work with the community. I, I um, go to conferences, I organize conferences, or help to organize conferences, I should say more accurately, do a bit of research, um, doing a PhD with Wolverhampton, and I'm funding some research in, with the University of Ireland. So I, I give you that background because um, I'm not going to talk about the technology of this, rather I'm going to come at this as a, a more sort of uh, philosophical point of view. So the reason we need to talk is because my contention is that the world of metrics, which involves uh, not just alt alternative metrics or, or bibliometrics, um, but also uh, download and usage and attention, these other um, important things, it also contains an, an element of peer review and qualitative metrics, which isn't usually something that we get to talk about um, on, on these kind of platforms. So usually I stand up in front of an audience and I talk about the seven or eight things that we can do with alt metrics that aren't actually metrics. Um, and today I'm going to turn that on its head and just talk about the metric side of it. M my contention is there that we are approaching uh, a revolution in how we, un how we use metrics and how metrics are being developed. Right. This isn't going to be an evolution, so we can't start with bibliometrics and sort of project forward. Rather, we have to acknowledge that what we have at the moment is a collision of varying different worlds, a massive investment in, in, um, in altmetrics and metrics, because the amount of um, interest and the value of metrics is increasing. And this has to do with, the, this is embedded in both a, a technological background, but also in, a, a, in a terms of a socioeconomic change in terms of the way that research works. Let's go back to that. Right, okay, so we're publishers. Um, most people here are publishers. And the reason why we need to have this conversation is because we are not only a big user, use, a user of metrics, but we're also a great generator of the data that lies behind metrics. And I'm gonna make that distinction right at the front because it's a really important one to make. When we think about what metrics are, we often think about it in terms of, of the data. And in our minds, the, there has been a conflation of the two things. So we talk about the impact factor and we all know how the impact factor is calculated more or less. We know that there is a basis of bibliometrics. The relationship between the two things has become uh, quite crystallized in our minds over the last 40 or 50 years. But we need to break these things apart and understand that where we have, we have data and we have metrics and in between those two, we have a, a level of analysis and interpretation and theory and maths and so forth. So that whenever we look at data and metrics, we have to recognize that metrics are definitely a proxy for something that are based upon the data. Now, this shouldn't be anything new. A hundred years ago, Werner Heisenberg and Niels Bohr um, discovered that any measurement is a proxy for a real world state. Um, they called it quantum mechanics. Now, I'm not going to stand in front of you and propose a, a whole new world of quantum metrics, but um, I sometimes feel that I'm getting a little bit close to it. So how, what do we mean when, when we talk about this gap, this, this proxy? Um, so that in terms of uh, inflation as being one of the examples there, we, we have a figure that we know as the cost of living index, um, and that's based on an, an activity, a, a standardized methodology but it's not involved in actually looking at your bank balances and then averaging it out. It's, it's, it's a proxy for a thing. So we have the economic growth, and we have uh, inflation, and the two things are linked by theories and statistical analysis and so forth. So every time that we, we, we talk about um, metrics and data, we have to acknowledge that there is this gap between the two things, and that, in that inside that gap, there are all sorts of interests, stakeholder interests, economic interests, political interests, policy decisions, point of view decisions. So what we are saying here is that there is a disconnect between the data and the metrics and that we have to unpack this as we go forward into the revolution and understand that there is a conversation to be had when we tie these things up. So I have, um, have had the great pleasure of speaking in front of an audience, a so-called audience at 5 p.m. on Friday. Um, what I saw was pretty much that. I think there were six people in the room. They were probably the organizers. <laughs> so if we think about 
the real world, it's very easy to see whether there's attention or not, whether there's interest or engagement, because it's right there in front of us. We can see the real world, we can count the number of people, I can see the number of faces looking at me, I know the people here are engaged. This means that that's very straightforward for me to understand as a speaker, whether I'm being relatively speaking successful in promoting my, uh, my presentation, whether I'm speaking uh, in, with the right amount of inflection to know that you are paying attention and are making notes. As soon as we in involve a proxy, we lose that level of interpretation. We, sorry, we have to add a level of interpretation in there that really doesn't exist. I mean, you know, we could, under different circumstances, recognise that we have an audience, but the audience aren't paying attention because it's 8 a.m. and it's a sales conference. Um, again, an experience that I've had, having a full audience, but nobody is paying attention or even able to pay attention. Um, whereas, and we can, we can look at the kind of positive aspects of this. You know, it's really easy when people put their hands up. We know that they're paying uh, attention to us. Very often we do, these pre um, we do presentations like this, and because we don't know the audience intimately, we may not make the necessary connection with them, and at the end of your talk, no hands come up. Um, we've probably all had, that, um, all, all had that experience. It's really hard to know whether people are asleep or drunk or, um, or you've just completely uh, bamboozled them with uh, the, the, sort of the technology you've used. But at least when the hands go up, we know something has worked. An absence of hands going up doesn't necessarily mean that people aren't engaged. And of course, as we move on to the brave new, um, always online world, it becomes incredibly difficult to know because everybody has a laptop in front of them or an iPad or a phone or something, and everybody is doing something with it. We have absolutely no means of knowing, as conference speakers, whether people have, um, are paying attention to us or not. So in the real world, it's getting harder, but this has absolutely no comparison to how the world of online publishing is going. We have, as I say, we have a, a, a revolution in terms of the way of met metrics are working. We can't just take bibliometrics on one side, you know, based on citation counts, and then stick our altmetric donut or, or, or altmetric brick or whatever it is uh, next to it and hope that this is um, sufficient for people to come to solid conclusions about it. Um, my contention is that um, the, 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 um, the changing socioeconomic background means that there is a change in research, that there is a great deal of interest in people getting more bang for their buck, that metrics offer a way of measuring that buck, or at least proxies for that buck. But as publishers, we're not in a position to say what kinds of questions people need to be asking when they um, come to our sites or come to the articles to see how, see how well those are performing. Up to pre the present day, metrics has been a very complicated thing. The maths involved in understanding how the impact factor or H indices have been calculated is not a very straightforward thing. Now we talk about, you know, we go back to the original days of uh, metrics 40, 50 years ago when we talk about people having to do card counts and so on, and there being many years of analysis before anybody was able to compute anything that looked like an impact factor. And of course the world has changed considerably from that. Everybody has, has, has a has the potential to have um, access to cloud explosive amounts of computer, um, computer power on the cloud. The data is readily available. You can get, download data sets um, very quickly. So we have moved from a world where it was perforce a specialist and complicated place, still complicated, but it looks a lot more simple because we all know what tweets look like. We can all get hold of the, hold of the figures and we can do all sorts of interesting things with those you know, using Excel and using our phones and our laptops. The world of uh, emerging metrics, therefore, is a lot more open than the world of bibliometrics could ever have been. And people's interest in it is changing. People are certainly more interested. If you look at, uh, I don't have this graph with me today, if you go to trends.google.com, you can type in bibliometrics, comma, altmetrics, you'll see that the interest in the term altmetrics has now comprehensively overtaken interest in the term bibliometrics. Um, and this will show you a trend that uh, is not going to go back. The world is more interested in metrics than they ever have been. And the reason is, for, as I say, very straightforward. The world of research is changing. The world of technology is changing. The data is there to be harvested and to be analyzed. And at the same time as that, funding agencies are more interested in understanding the impact of their research. 
I suspect that what we're seeing here is a, a, an increasing amount of commoditization in research. Um, one has to ask the question whether there is going to be a, a primarchization of, um, of research. You know, the, the, the question is, if you can fund a, a single postdoc in the UK for the same amount of money that you can fund 100 um, postdocs in China, whether there is a payoff there, and whether funding agencies are going to start changing the way that they look at the world. Metrics is one of the things that they may very well be looking at to use uh, when they start making decisions like that. But we need to be open to how we talk about metrics. The value is there. The value is uh, increasing the investment is going in. There, there, is more, there are more startups involved in metrics. There is more data available. People are doing more com computation on it. And people are going to be making more decisions about it. We see that uh, various statements on, uh, from funding agencies say that metrics are becoming more important. Something that we couldn't possibly have seen 10 years ago is now becoming the standard. But we are part of this scholarly community, every bit as much as the researchers and the funding agencies. And we need to be very aware about what's happening in metrics and how people are using our data. We are, of course, providing data through our APIs and through uh, counter reports and so forth. And these are, um, and in fact, in the case of altmetrics, you don't even need to be providing data because these are harvested through different platforms. Um, we can't just be passive Bro, um, we don't, can't pay, play a passive role in, in the world of metrics. We need to recognize that we have a position in here. Because apart from anything else, people are going to be using metrics to decide how well our platforms are performing and whether we are doing what we can do to enhance readership. So we will be measured by these metrics, every bit as much as researchers will be. What I find quite interesting is that the the kinds of questions that people ask of metrics are becoming apparently more simple because we're moving on from a position where people are asking uh, questions about the relative change of speed of you know, the deltas of uh, metrics, whether these are couched in um, complex terms like h-index or z-index, but rather people are asking real-world questions. And th these are an example of the sort of the questions that people are asking. You know, the, the words that they're using are about attention and engagement and and um, whether the thing's being looked at or downloaded or used. We're not asking these very technical questions, we're asking very general questions. And these words aren't terribly well defined when we come to the world of metrics. And again, it's my contention that we need to have conversations about how those words are used and what those words mean. We can talk about, um, in, in fact, I read a paper uh, this morning, um, just before I came down here, that was talking about, uh, was saying that Twitter's tweets, rather, Twitter tweet counts, um, is a, a proxy for social impact. Um, social impact is a great term because it's one of those things that sound as if they're really well defined, but if you go onto Wikipedia or, in fact, go anywhere, you will struggle to find any, um, any definition of social impact that makes any kind of sense. You know, if we, if, we, if we go to Wikipedia, you can look up an h-index and there's a formula that you can copy into Excel and you can recompute your h-index from scratch. And we have problems because words like attention seem to be obvious. And, and words like authority have completely different um, meanings. If you're an educationalist, the word authority has one meaning. If you are a, somebody who does research in social networks, authority has a completely different meaning. Um, and certainly when we as publishers talk about you know, authority, we have different ideas in our heads. And we have this interesting um, place where we have loads of people from different disciplines coming together, different um, industries coming together to talk about um, what we do, and they all use these words in different kinds of ways. And again, we need to be very open when we talk about these things, very careful to define exactly what we mean. If we're talking about social impact, well, I know what I think social impact is. I think it is the expression of scholarly research at a societal level. So perhaps for not-for-profits, in laws, in, um, in governance, in professional bodies. That's what I understand social impact to be. But clearly the authors of the paper that I was reading this morning had, a, had um, I don't know, some very poorly defined, but anyway, I'm, I'm not gonna, I'll go into pub peer later and criticize their paper.
It's an extremely diverse community. These people, all these people who are interested in metrics, whether we are publishers or researchers or funding agencies or policy bodies, whether we're um, traditionally part of the academic community or, or simply becoming part of it by, um, as a consequence of, uh, of history, um, we have very different points of view, very different ways of using these languages. The idea that we can somehow homogenize this from a top-down approach that there is anyone who can say, well, authority in the, academic mean, in the academic world means this, is absolute nonsense. We have um, massive amounts of uh, variation. There is, of course, the, the NISO project that Ewan is involved with, which is a largely US-centered um, approach um, to look at how we might standardize some of these things. Um, but really, that's a place for listening. I don't think that NISO is in a position where they can decide or tell, for example, the EU, um, what authority means in terms of an academic setting. We have such different cultures. And this is, uh, for people who are just coming to metrics, I, I, I always find it very interesting because people say that you know, the, the research in the field is two or three years old. And that's absolutely true. When you talk about alt metrics, people have been doing research for two or three years. But there are papers going back 50 years in terms of bibliometrics. If you want to know what citation means, I, can, I don't have a reference with me, but I can point you at papers that will tell you why citations are different. There are theories of citation. There are arguments about it. There are centers of it. I mean, we're talking about a very rich scholarly world. And these two, these two fields of altmetrics and bibliometric research have only really started coming together in the last year to 18 months. We've only started seeing the same kinds of people People like um, Ewan, who, is, who, uh, who works, um, founded a startup, um, working alongside people, as, as he said, Paul Voters, who is a, um, a more of a traditional bibliometrician. This is a relatively new thing. There are different kinds of languages here. We're just starting to see a, uh, people citing each other. And that, for me, is a very interesting thing, because those two worlds are definitely converging somewhere. Um, and again, we see uh, companies like Elsevier acquiring startups. And again, we know we, we learn lessons. We all learn lessons. So we have very different cultures, very different approaches to how we talk about things, how we innovate, and how we use these different terms and different kinds of mathematics. And certainly, the, the, the rigor that is uh, placed upon us is a very different one. It is very, very hard to come to uh, come to a decision about how we use words. But the way that I think the way that we need to approach this is by revolutionizing the way that we deal with these things. So rather than taking a very uh, proprietary, private view of data, we have to turn things on its head and start talking about things in a much more open way, much more community-driven sense. But it's not up to Elsevier or any other publisher in this world to say what authority means. But we can make the data available to people who are interested in this. If we're not going to have um, an agreement on what social impact is, then we're not in any place to define that. We're not in any place to give you a figure and say, this is your social impact figure. But what we can do is to formulate ways of approaching an answer towards this question. It is up to the community to ask the questions. The question of um, uh, uh, someone in Oxfam saying, what is the social impact of this research is going to be a very different one from somebody who is uh, in a government position or for that matter funding, um, fun looking to fund research or, or working within an institution. So it's up to us to say what these things are. And our response, uh, the way that we're looking at metrics has been very much uh, expressed through uh, an excellent paper that I linked there written by my colleague, my colleague, Dr. Lisa College, the um, Elsevier's response to the, the Hefke initiative on metrics. Um, and you can have, download that and have a look at it. It's very readable. Um, but it goes into some of the things that we think are very important. We talk about openness. We talk about discussing. We talk about community-led metrics. We talk about providing different kinds of metrics so that rather than offering one number that says, for example, social impact is this, rather we might offer a succession of numbers and qualitative analyses and graphics and visualizations that enable people to make up the answer to their own story as they see fit. And there is a, a nice quote which you will find on the Snowball Metrics um, site from uh, Jennifer Johnson, who's head of performance at the University of Leeds, that goes into 
what, how we have been working with the Snowball Metrics project. So Snowball Metrics is a project that enables institutions to compare their performance. Um, what they publish isn't a single number, but rather a recipe for making, um, making your mind up. Um, it tells you where, where you can, the sorts of things you can use, the sorts of data that they, they recommend being used. What they don't say is to come to a conclusion, this is the figure that you must work with. Um, and this is very much how Elsevier see our role in developing metrics. It's not about producing individual numbers, rather it's about producing um, a, a landscape of numbers from which people can choose the right kind of figures and answers. So I'm going I'm to make up a metric. This isn't a metric that you're going to see appear on Scopus um, anytime soon. This is a metric that I made up in my head um, yesterday afternoon. Um, so let's say that um, we want to understand how internationalist a researcher is. There are, there are many reasons for doing this. For, for example, a, a university might want to hire someone who has a good record in building international relationships because they want to increase the number of students that are coming to their university. They may, on the other hand, wish to employ a lecturer who isn't always swan, swanning off to uh, glamorous conferences like this one, but rather is staying at home and teaching. So we have a different way there. There's no, there's no good, there's no bad. It just provides a landscape. So how, how might we derive this? Well, we might use an altmetric source uh, like Zotero or Mendeley to tell us about how international the audience might be. We might do a citation analysis or a co-authorship analysis to see whether this person is being cited overseas, whether they are actively working with overseas. And again, there are all sorts of interesting things to, to know about this. For example, people who work... Um, who work internationally get cited more often. Um, I, I find this a really interesting thing. I, it, one of my top recommendations to any researcher in their, in their sort of 20s or 30s would be to go and work overseas for a year or two because it has a very noticeable impact on the amount of citation they get. And if you think about it, it's perfectly reasonable. If I go to Denmark and work with uh, someone called Jorgensen, um, when I've left Denmark, years ahead in the future, I will still be interested in how Jorgensen's career is, and hopefully him in mind. So we're far more likely to read their papers and cite their papers. It, it's, it's a pretty obvious thing, but it's a very noticeable thing. Um, so internationalism might be a very interesting thing. But let's get away, f you can get away from the numbers. We can have a look at, well, how often does someone get in invited to speak at one of these glamorous conferences? Do they get invited to work? Uh, you know, medium to short term uh, overseas. We could even do a text analysis of their content using our text, um, text and data mining frameworks to see whether or not these um, academics you talk about international things in, in, a, in a comparatively with other, with other researchers. So it's a very, very complicated thing. And what I'm saying here is there is a big bag of, uh, of um, data and views that might allow us to take a view of what internationalism is, but it's not my job as Elsevier or as any other publisher to say, this is, uh, this is the Elsevier index for internationalization. This isn't going to happen. Expect to see more of this type of mixed uh, metrics, uh, more qualitative work, more quantitative work, but it's our view that these need to be open and community-led, and when I say community-led, it is up to the community to say, we believe that engagement in this sense means this, and we suggest that you can use either the, the Elsevier figures or the Wiley figures, whatever kind of figures it is, to come to a conclusion about um, engagement. I don't think that metrics is a place where you are going to see publishers having the same kind of uh, impact that you might have seen us having 30 years ago. This is something which is of more interest than it, to more people coming from more disciplines than it has ever been before. Um, I leave that as a conclusion. Um, I would urge us all to have a, an active role in the community, to go to meetings, to write papers, to pay attention to what funders have to say about metrics, and to make our data available. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're almost out of time, but perhaps just one question, uh, one or two for Mike. Does anybody have a question? Uh, Toby Waller from Juve again. Um, it's very interesting, the, the criteria and the mix that you put there to open up the whole 
um, element of metrics. I was just wondering how much semantic tagging of content, uh, drilling right down into the very specified terms in content, is something that should be considered in the mix? Well, it's certainly something that, um, as a company, we're very interested in. I mean, we have um, a, various amount of, a various number of semantic tagging um, projects underway, both internally and externally. Whether we're going to see that reflected in terms of the um, in terms of metrics is probably a question which is uh, not really at my level. One of the things that I, um, we can we can explore, for example, I was looking at the geotagging of content in papers, which is quite an interesting thing because um, we don't talk about this very often, but it's it's very interesting to see to do a, a geographical tag of a, of a paper and to locate it in space. Um, and particularly in the case of something like linguistics or, or um, archaeology. And yet it's not done. I mean, we don't, we, you can't go to a Google map and get a map of, of research where, we're talk, where, where the map you're seeing is of papers talking about places. Um, so, for example, I mean, that's something which is relatively straightforward to compute. And there, are, there, there is a code base that enables you to do the text mining and to locate that. So it's, my, it's not something that um, you might necessarily see Elsevier do, but it's something you might see a startup do. If anybody has any money to invest, then. <laughs>